Thank you for joining us today uh, for our Sunday service. If you want to stop the video and listen to your favorite worship music, you can do that right now. If you want to just keep rolling, uh, we invite you to do so. It's so great that we could join together virtually. It'd be wonderful if we could come together in person, and maybe that one that day will come soon. But in the meantime, thank you for tuning in. I also want to thank those that have uh, dropped off their offerings either in person or through the mail, and many have also uh, taken advantage of the e-transfer option. And if you have questions about that, you can look at the give aspect of this uh, web page. Well, we're going to continue our series looking at coping with COVID-19. And as I talk to people, I, I notice that there's a sense of, of anxiety, uh, maybe even a little bit of discouragement. But those sorts of feelings ha- kind of weigh upon us as, as this continues on. And so we're going to look at that today, coping with COVID-19, coping with anxiety. And we're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 to 10. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him and stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray in this time that you would be a source of encouragement and a source of strength. We thank you, Lord, for each person that's tuned in. We thank you for their life. We thank you for their home. And we pray, Lord, your peace and your protection. We continue to pray for our land. We pray for, Lord, all those that are doing their best to serve, whether it be in a grocery store or a truck driver, whether it be in the medical field. Lord, we pray your protection upon them. We also pray, Lord, for for those that that are just wrestling with how to, to deal with everything that's coming at us these days. So let us find strength in your word, I ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It's now been about seven weeks since we've been able to worship together in church or to get together with friends and family. And while we understand the situation and do our best to connect virtually, it's not the same, is it? All these restrictions can be difficult for us because for the most part, we're used to being able to do what we want to do or go anywhere we want to go. But right now, that's not the case. And while we try to make the best of the situation, We still struggle with the uncertainty of knowing when all these restrictions will come to an end. Those whose jobs have been affected by this virus, they wonder how they're going to afford to live. And students who are studying at home wonder what their education will look like moving forward. Those waiting for surgeries are doing their best to be patient in spite of the discomfort and the pain. And so as we grapple with how to adjust to all these changes that are taking place, it's not uncommon to experience some anxiety and worry within our hearts and our minds. But instead of unraveling or being caught in the depths of despair, Peter suggests another approach, one that he learned as he grappled with the feelings of embarrassment and regret and profound loss associated with his denial of Jesus on that night before Jesus was crucified. Peter, he had been so confident. He had been so sure of himself. But when Jesus was arrested and killed, well, things started to feel a little out of control. The disciples remained in hiding for fear that they too would be arrested and killed. And everything was happening so fast that even after Christ's resurrection, Peter wondered where he stood with the Lord. The angel told the disciples to go back to Galilee, where the risen Lord would appear to them. But as they waited, Peter gets antsy and suggests that they go fishing. Perhaps it was a sign that he was considering going back to his old life. The circumstances of his original calling were repeated. They fished all night, but they caught nothing. And then Jesus calls out to them in John 21, verse 6, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did... They were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. 
John 21 verse 9 says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Have you ever smelled a charcoal fire? That's the same kind of fire that Peter sat around the night that he denied Jesus at the house of Caiaphas. And the very smell of it caused Peter to turn his attention back to the net. He even took time to count the fish, 153. It's after breakfast that Jesus restores Peter with that threefold, do you love me? And then feed my sheep. I don't think that was too easy for Peter. He couldn't stand before Jesus in his normal bravado and pride. No, he had to stand there in humility. And after the third time that Jesus asked, do you love me? The text tells us that Peter was hurt. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So when Peter suggests that we humble ourselves before God, that we own up to our doubts, our fears, and our shortcomings, as difficult as that might be, he does so because he understands that it's there in the place of humility where we can find forgiveness and grace and restoration. And this enables us to face the future, not with doubt and despondency, which are often born out of our own insecurities, but rather we can face the future as uncertain as it might be with humble confidence born out of the fact that we are loved and valued by God. And so Peter can say, cast your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. But sometimes we're like the old guy who was carrying a heavy bag toward town. Some missionaries stopped to give him a ride. Hop in the back of the truck, they said. But as they drove along, they noticed the man was still standing up in the back, holding that bag and doing his best to keep his balance on that bumpy safari road. They wonder, why didn't he just put his burden down? Or even just sit down in the back and and rest in, in, in the back of the truck. And yet, here we are holding on to our burdens and our worries and our fears. And the Lord says, why are you doing that? Why are you carrying your burdens all alone? Didn't Jesus say in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest? Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you, and he will never let the righteous fall. When I was a lifeguard, we would often have to practice vertical spinal rescues in the deep water. The first lifeguard would come and immobilize the victim, and only with legs keep the victim both still and above water. It was exhausting, and before long, the rescuer becomes tired. So a second lifeguard comes near and supports the first guard by treading water themselves, and together they gently make their way to the edge of the pool. That's what Jesus does. You see, he supports and sustains us in the middle of the trials of life. And we can have confidence that he'll help us because, as Peter has already told us, he cares for you. Sometimes we assume that God's care will somehow exempt us from having to face difficult moments in life. But that's not true. Just look at what's happening right now around the world. This coronavirus has gripped the entire planet. People all over the world are grappling with how to live in quarantine, including those who know the Lord. The old devil will tell us, well, God doesn't love us anymore, or that he's abandoned us. Because according to him, God's love is only evident when there's an absence of difficulty in our lives. But that's not true. God's love is evident right there in the middle of challenges that we face. And because of that, we know that we don't have to face them alone. Look at verse 10. And the God of all grace who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. And so we humble ourselves and we trust God. But we also are called to be self-controlled and alert. Verse 8, be alert and of sober minds. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When we moved into our present house, I was a little bit concerned because we had a gas range. When I was a child, one of the teachers at the school I went to was burned when her apron caught fire. And so when our our granddaughter decided she wanted to learn how to cook, we made sure we reminded her how important it was to be careful around the flame. Well, in the same way, Peter asks us to be careful, to be sober, to be self-controlled, because our enemy is dangerous, and he knows how to manipulate and take advantage of his opportunities. 
So if we become careless with regards to the things we consume or think about, we might find ourselves fighting battles that we might not have had to fight if we had been more self-controlled. Let's be honest, though. We can't blame the devil for everything. For instance, so many have been joking about gaining a few extra pounds during this quarantine. And if we do, well, that's on us. That's not the devil's fault. However, we still need to be aware that he's going to try to manipulate that situation, maybe trying to make us feel badly about ourselves, maybe trying to get us to beat ourselves up, or, or maybe even to believe that God can't love us anymore. He might even test us to see if our level of resistance has been so weakened to the point that we would give in to sinful desires without giving up much of a fight. Remember, he's a roaring lion, and he's looking for someone to devour. And he would like that someone to be you and me. He'll do everything in his power to deceive and to discourage and to degrade us. Can you imagine how young Joseph felt when his 10 brothers sold him into slavery? It would have been so easy for him to give in to bitterness and self-loathing and despair. However, even though he was in a foreign land far away from home, Joseph sensed God's hand upon him, allowing him to stand strong and firm and steadfast. And despite the injustices that were done to him, he was, God was faithful. That was evident in Joseph's attitude. Both Potiphar and the prison warden, warden recognized that the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. And although Joseph didn't know it at the time, God was preparing him for what was ahead, first by learning how to manage a household, and then learning how to take care of a prison, and then finally, how to lead a nation. Now, no one likes difficult times, and yet in the midst of them, if we pay attention, we can see God at work. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You know, it was the toughest time of my life. I'd been pretty hurt, and I wasn't sure I wanted to pastor another church again. I went to a park to walk and to pray, and as I approached the man-made lake, I noticed that it had been drained. It looked so barren and ugly. I asked a city worker who was nearby what was going on, and he told me that the only way to clean out the algae is to drain the lake, and then after some treatments to refill it with fresh water. All of a sudden, God spoke to my spirit. I've allowed this trial, which has emptied you, but I will use it to get rid of the algae in your life. So don't despair. I'm in control. And soon I will fill you again with living water, which can't be exhausted, and you will teem with life and beauty again. That was a healing moment for me, for it assured me of God's care and protection. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with the righteous hand. Helen Steiner Rice, whose father died in the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, wrote this poem, and I think you'll find it helpful. Our father knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We love the sound of laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts would lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. Our Father tests us often with suffering and with sorrow. He tests us not to punish us, but to help us meet tomorrow. For growing trees are strengthened when they withstand the storm, and the sharp cut of the chisel gives the marble grace and form. God never hurts us needlessly. He never wastes our pain. For every loss he sends is followed by rich gain. And when we count the blessings that God has so freely sent, we will find no cause for murmuring and no time to lament. For our Father loves his children, and to him all things are plain. So he never sends us pleasure, when the soul's deep need is pain. So whenever we are troubled and everything goes wrong, it's just God working in us to make our spirits strong. Lastly, Peter says that we can stand firm and resist the devil. Verse 9, resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And if others can face suffering and heartache, 
while maintaining a fervent faith in Christ, then so can we. For the same Holy Spirit who dwells in them dwells in you and in me. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, the devil can war and intimidate and browbeat with the best of them. However, when we ask the Lord to help us, the devil will flee. James tells us that. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Come near to God and he will come near to you. You see, we don't have to put up with the devil's lies, abuse, or constant badgering, for there is victory in Jesus. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So, that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. I know that there's challenges at the moment. And while we see glimmers of hope as the provinces look for ways to loosen restrictions, I hope and I pray that we will not give in to discouragement and anxiety. Let's be aware of the enemy. He's very good at what he does. Let's be careful not to give him an occasion to wreak havoc in our hearts or our homes. For we serve a God, a God who is faithful, and he can grant his children peace and courage and strength. He will sustain us and will bring forth tremendous fruit in our lives if we will trust him. Are you going through a tough time right now? Remember, you don't have to carry the burden all alone. You can lay your burdens down at the foot of the cross. And just like the old hymn says, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Why don't you sing it with me? Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today knowing that all power and authority belongs to you. Thank you for loving and caring for us, enough to send Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord. We humble ourselves before you, and we ask that you will help us overcome our fear, our anxiety, or whatever else tends to torment us. We know we have an enemy. Help us to resist him and stand firm in the faith. Thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus, and allow us to grow closer to to you, that our lives might bring you honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you. We are going to be participating in the communion service, so if you want to just wait or stop the video here and go get uh, your your crackers and your juice and get ready and uh, join me for a communion service. Thanks so much. God bless you. Thanks for staying and joining with me in this communion service. What a privilege it is to reflect upon all that Jesus has done for us and to remember and to rejoice and to be thankful. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I passed unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I noticed that we had left this spike here up on the pulpit for our Easter service, and I just was thinking about what was that like, uh, to have a spike similar to this to go into your hands, into your feet, and the suffering that Jesus endured upon the cross. It was horrific. And in that garden, as he prayed before the cross, 
He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. There be any other way for you and I to find salvation, to find freedom from sin, to find peace with God. But there was no other way. There was no other plan. The only plan was for Jesus to take upon himself our sin. And so he says, I'll go. Not my will, but thy will be done. And so he already knew that he was going to do that because that very night before he prayed, he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so we hold this piece of bread. It reminds us that we are loved and we are valued and that Jesus was willing to go to the cross so that you and I could be saved. Let's pray and thank him for this emblem. So Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this emblem of the broken body of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to take the cup of suffering for us, that you were willing to pay the price of our sin. And so as we partake, we rejoice in the fact that we are loved and valued. And Lord, that you would go to such great depths to show us your, your wonderful plan of salvation. So we pray you bless this emblem now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And when Jesus went upon the cross, I think probably the greatest thing was that he had to take upon my sin and your sin. And as he did that, he had to bear the wrath of the Father. And just think, for the first time in all of eternity, the Father turned his back upon the Son. And in that moment, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken so that you and I would not have to be forsaken. He said on the cross, it is finished. He has paid for our sin full, full payment, full atonement. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, assuring us that when we come in the, the precious blood of Jesus, when we receive forgiveness, when we receive his righteousness, when we receive his peace, that we will stand before the Heavenly Father, not in our own sin, but in his purity. And so as we hold this emblem of his shed blood, let's remember the great depths to which he went to make sure that we could have right standing with the Father. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful again for the sacrifice of Jesus. You said, Jesus said that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you were willing to go to the cross, fully God and fully man, and that you took upon yourself our sin, and you grant to us your peace and your purity. And so we thank you for this emblem, and we honor you, and we look forward to your coming, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Well, thank you for joining me, and Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Amen.